that looks good. Okay. Well, it's Wednesday, and that means Magnus Haystick, who is the best dad. Oh, what a lovely cup you've got there, Magnus. Hmm. Let me, let me, oh, let me, get, let me you... bring it back, yes. That was Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Father's, Father's Day, Day gift, you. Yeah. Well, I, and we do we do think about our kids, don't we? I mean, there's a you're very lucky. You've got all your children around you. I do indeed. I've got uh, all six of them are around, and uh, you know, very important to me. Very important to me. Like like everybody, the kids are important. Yeah, and uh, I guess after this past week, uh, it, interesting. We got so much to talk about, but maybe let's start off. Uh, with a comment that Charles Savage, and you know Charles, the, the founder of Easy Equities, that he made, it was right in the middle, admittedly, of all the chaos and uh, quite a bit of jitteriness going on. And he was saying that he thinks that anybody up to the age of 35 uh, would be thinking very differently about their lives uh, in South Africa, any South Africans. And he's got young children, it's, or he has children, not not young, but uh, he he made those comments, which... I guess, you know, you always tell it straight, as it is. I presume you would not disagree with him. Many, many people with kids of that age are having those discussions. A lot of people with kids at that age are talking to their kids. In fact, I had lunch with my son. He's about 31, 32. And he has lived overseas for many years. And he speaks Chinese, Portuguese, Spanish, and uh, English and Afrikaans. So he suddenly said to me, Dad, should I go? Should I stay? And he's a qualified CFP. And he was discussing with me whether he should go and write the exam in Britain and go and, go and, go and practice his, his craft there. His wife has got a British uh, passport. So suddenly that discussion is, is, is being held in South African households where this thing is possible. So you're quite right. I listened to Charles, and a lot of people are saying, you know, um, should we not educate our children and then send them abroad because you need to start thinking about plan b so even in our household we are having those discussions and it wasn't on the table previously i've, I've let my kids decide i haven't tried to influence them believe it or not i they know my views and now suddenly my youngest son he said look uh, maybe we should investigate and previously my daughter who's a qualified attorney and a trust specialist was thinking maybe she should go and write the Australian exam or or, or so, so people are looking at alternatives if they have experienced they have never experienced what was hap what happened last week I mean you and I but young uh, older we saw what it was like during the Soweto riot 76 and 85 and we almost kind of um, have gone through that but I think for a whole generation of younger professionals, they could not see what they were witnessing on our TV screens last week. And it came as an absolute shock to them and said, wow, I didn't believe it can get so bad. We will be having a webinar tomorrow. I'll uh, have you know that the uh, business community has reacted uh, very rapidly to a little note that I sent out this morning. Last I looked, we had 1,500 registrations already. So, uh, and that's on the subject of quo vadis, as you call it, you know, where to. Just not everybody uh, who's listening to this will be able to make that webinar tomorrow. Uh, what is the thrust of, of your thesis right now about Quo, Quo Vardis South Africa? Well, I've been thinking about it and what I've been trying to read as widely as I can. And some there was a brilliant piece by Brian Pottinger on your website yesterday, which was which was fantastic. Moluets and Becky. And then in other media publications, and everybody is now focusing on where are we as a country right now? How did we get here? Which is a whole debate by itself. And how are we going to get out of it if we're going to get out of it? And what needs to be done? One now cannot just simply dismiss, oh, that South Africa will never become a failed state. That would be quite foolish and short-sighted. So if you're saying my scenario planning involves the following a b or c how does it affect your investment decision making and what can you do with the assets that you have or the assets that you will earn in the future so it's a wide-ranging debate looking at the various ways to plan for a very uncertain future yeah and it certainly is something that is front and center for most thinking 
South Africans now. There are, however, many people who are of an age who who wouldn't want to uh, leave. Well, nobody wants to leave this beautiful country, but who would find too, that too much of a disruption. What about your clients? What are they saying to you? Well, our clients have been, um, to a certain degree, uh, uh, some of our clients, I can't put a percentage exactly to it, but 10, 15, maybe 20%. We have seen that their children have been living for quite some time and then sometimes themselves. But it's very difficult and becoming very expensive to up and leave and go and buy property in Australia, New Zealand, or any other part of the world for that matter. But they do say, I will educate my child as best I can. I will give him or her an, in, a global education, either accountancy, medical, engineering, and then they must go and start a new life uh, somewhere else with our financial support and our emotional support. That, I'm afraid, is going to accelerate quite dramatically. We have these discussions with our clients, and we are, often ask, we say, where is Yanni? And Yanni is in London. And Sunny? No, Sunny is in Australia. So the, the South African diaspora has been happening for quite some time under the radar Sometimes people go and work elsewhere to make some money because they couldn't find jobs in South Africa. But a lot of them are saying they must go and they must not come back. We will support them from South Africa as a parental support. We have some capital. We will export our capital, help our kids set up property or maybe a business. And, and that will be almost our legacy to our children. And strangely enough, I spoke to someone yesterday, a black gentleman, who's doing exactly the same with for his kids. He has already uh, bought property in, in Mauritius. He's an engineer. And it's not a, a black and white thing. Yeah. It's, 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 he said, I'm out of here. And we have Indian clients in Pozula Natal who've been saying the same for a long time. So people are looking at opportunities elsewhere than South Africa. I guess the, the issue that one often forgets is it isn't just a, it's not a racial divide. It's about those people prepared to sacrifice, work harder, make something of their lives. And as a consequence of that, if they're putting in longer hours or studying more, they are going to earn more money. They're going to be middle class or better. And they are not going to want to have to sacrifice again everything that they've built up over that time. And that's that's got no race barriers. But there is an interesting point. Just after we arrived in London, we went there for three years in 2000, 2016, I met with Reg Bamford, who's a South African who started a company there called Sable and uh, many, many years ago. And he said to me that his advice to South Africans was, you don't always have to emigrate. You don't have to go somewhere else, but your money can. So you can, you can put your money there. It can work harder for you. And is the, if there's a need, you can follow it there. Do you think that that, that philosophy is changing, that not only is your money going there, but maybe you should be thinking of going as well. We've been trying to convey, convey that message to our clients, whom we consider to be global citizens for a long time. We, um, as a small company 10 years ago, set up our own global balance fund to give our clients exposure into the global markets at a very low cost. And that, that fund is now up to you know, one and a half billion rand and doing extremely well, beating the big, bigger brand names because of the cost structures. Mm -hmm. So our clients have been very comfortable with our approach. It's not been panic selling. It's not being alarmist. We just simply saying that you're a global citizen and you cannot keep all your money in one country. And it was not about politics in the early days. What intrigued me about what was happening elsewhere was Wall Street, Silicon Valley, the phenomenal innovation taking place in the United States, in Israel, in Switzerland. And I was very attracted to those investments because I saw what was happening personally. I went there a couple of times, London, New York, Los Angeles, you know, that's what we do. And based purely on statistical uh, outperformance, we said invest offshore. And of course, we, we were attacked and uh, attracted a lot of uh, unfair criticism and they got it totally wrong. They said it was emotion and I'm um, patriotic, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. It was not. It was getting good returns for my clients. And our clients, and, and I have got a number of messages last week or two saying thank you 
for externalizing such a large portion of our, our, our portfolio, we now see what you mean. And uh, that, that, that story has not changed. And, and, and it's a pity that so many large companies with massive vested interest basically were spinning a different story all day long. And, and their clients are paying the price today. Yeah, and, and you think about that, many of those large companies have themselves externalized, or at least attempted to externalize, but uh, you're talking about large South African companies. However, they didn't make much of a success on the other side of the water. So it's quite ironic that uh, they themselves are uh, were trying to follow advice which they weren't giving to the clients here in South Africa. But the, the real issue, and we don't really talk about politics, you and I, we talk more about the the impact on on wealth, but we're at a watershed, unquestionably, in what happens in this country into the future. And one of the points that was raised by um, David Shapiro, I think it was, he says what worries him is that the ANC, after this disaster, after seeing the impact of high unemployment, how a short was a it was a, a deliberate effort to to uh, at sedition um, and it is it's it's got very dark undertones on what happened in the past week but how it was so easy to get people to go into the stalls and start looting and what he's saying is, is what worries him is that this ANC government instead of seeing the light and instead of seeing how you address the issue of unemployment by creating jobs by freeing the economy is going to go the other way and double down on a system which I did the numbers this morning uh, has given us 18 and a half million social grant recipients and now uh, President Ramaphosa wants to add another 45 billion rand to that through a basic income grant it, it it just seems as though if that's the path that's being followed on then any rational uh, observer would have to think twice about where this country economy might be heading i share those sentiments because i also tweeted on said that's exactly what government cannot do is to double down on what they've already been doing and which is caused to by and large the massive unemployment the unhappiness the anger uh, and it was all just a compendium of, of of problems and and which 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 caused this uprising in my view which because of social media today a message like that gets transmitted instantaneously across multiple uh, platforms, WhatsApps, Twitter, you name it, and there's an uprising. So um, the, 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 the letter that struck me as very ominous was the one published on one of the websites, the letter by Toyota South Africa. Um, if you know a little bit about the Japanese culture, they are not confrontational. They don't threaten, they don't want to embarrass people, you know, all those cultural traits of Japanese. But for them to write a letter like that, and it gets published to the Durban municipality and saying, guys, we are at very close to pulling out of South Africa. That, to me, is a very, very dire warning that if it's not handled correctly, I mean, can you imagine Toyota pulling out of South Africa uh, which is a major, major investor. And that'll be the signal to other companies, LG or whom, it doesn't matter. They might just reconsider the operations in South Africa. That'll lead to a cascade of foreign investments pulling out of South Africa. So we are, we have to consider these issues. And the way government deals with it going forward is incredibly important. What I cannot agree with, for instance, where there was a columnist in Business Day who wrote a piece yesterday who was saying everything's fine it's priced into the markets and we are beginning with the rebuild of the south african economy blah 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 it was it was actually it was embarrassing for an economist to, to write such rubbish because right next door was a piece by hillary joffe who wrote this piece about the imf doing a deep dive into what social unrest does to the, a, a country's economy. And they said, do not dismiss it as just a once-off event. It has a very deep and structural effect on uh, confidence, foreign investment, 
uh, economic growth, uh, which lasts for years. And, you know, I'm inclined to believe that's what's going to happen. Everybody is saying, well, look at the RAND. The RAND hasn't crashed. The, the, the smart money is they are deliberating whether to put more money into South Africa. The RAND is starting to weaken. The bond yields are starting to blow out a little bit. Our stock market is suddenly having an outflow of cash. It's the longer term effect of what we saw on our television screens last last week, which were absolutely Hollywood could not have done a better apocalyptic movie than what we saw on our screens happening to businesses, uh, infrastructure, people, big, large, small. It was just astonishing what we saw on our TV screens. I spoke to a client of mine who lives in Belita. You know, Belita, they blocked off the bridge to go into Belita. Their biggest issue weren't the looters. It was the police who came to arrest them, came to town to get, you're not allowed to do this, they were told. Here is a first-hand account, uh, and they actually told the police to bugger off, we will not obey your instructions. We outnumber you, we outgun you, leave. We are here to protect our community, and that saved Belita. He says there were so many people trying to get across the bridge. And if they were not there, Belita would have been gutted. They were on the way to the Belita Mall. So we don't actually really comprehend what happened in KZN um, uh, last week and, and, and what it's done to the damage to the psyche, property values, factory values. It, it, it's going to take a very long time to heal. I'm glad you shared that story because I have uh, family coming from the province, uh, family, lots of friends, and those are those are the same uh, retorts that come back to me. Where were the police when we needed them? And in fact, when they come along, it's almost like they were uh, then attacking or perhaps participating. It was the perception anyway that they were participating with the looters and maybe they were in cahoots with the looters. There was a the best story that I heard was from uh, Jason McCormick who said, just down the road from one of their shopping centers was a police station. It's on the interview. It's worth listening to. But I think he said it was 500 meters away. And as the looting and rioting began, the police station was boarded up and they all left. All the policemen went home and uh, on the pretext that they hadn't been given an increase when they last demanded one. It's this kind of issue that 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 uh, that, that does it, it, it damages the psyche, and you you start thinking, well, if you're paying your taxes to somebody who's not there when you need them most, uh, but Magnus, just just to close off with, when you have a look ahead into the future for your clients, when they come back to you, they say, I I was uh, gobsmacked by what by what happened last week. I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime. Um, I have pushed money offshore. What do I do now? Do do I just wait for the next one and hope that they uh, that the that that it doesn't ever happen, or do I find myself uh, an alternative? Uh, do I move to the Western Cape, perhaps, which seems to be uh, the the safest route to South Africa right now? I think a lot of people are saying, "Look, I don't want to leave a country. Let's let's physically move down to the Western Cape." So the Western Cape, Southern Cape, will benefit. I've spoken to many people. I, in fact, I, uh, I spoke to the Valdivie people telling me the phones are ringing. Everybody's saying, what can I rent? What can I buy? Not everybody are fortunate enough to have available cash because they have to first sell the, the upcountry property before they can make the move. That's going to continue and has been continuing for many, many years. It will accelerate. Secondly, as a company, you know, we have nine offices countrywide. I had a whip, quick whip around the country, phoning the guys and saying, how busy are you? And they all just said, we are drowning in, in new business. People are saying, I've got cash somewhere. I've got a preservation fund that I thought I'll just leave until retirement. Wherever people can ex access cash, liquid cash in retirement annuities, preservation funds, endowments, they are whipping them out. They are saying, I'm paying the taxes if I have to. Don't come with that argument that it's panic stations because it is panic stations. I want some money offshore. You know, on, on that point, one, one, one mustn't dismiss the possibility of if we have another scenario like this. You know, one, one of the implications of a state of emergency is likely that foreign exchange controls will be reintroduced. That's part and parcel of a state of emergency. 
Now, nobody can say it cannot have happened and nobody can say it's going to happen, but uh, there's a possibility that it might happen. If that were to happen now with South Africa, you will feel the pain on the bond market and on the currency uh, because that's precisely the time that you want to externalize money, but now you can't. And government does already control flow of money through pension funds and through immigration funds. So people are saying, I want I want an estate. I want an offshore estate. Markets might be high. The rand might be strong. I don't care. This is about me and my family and my future. And I will do whatever I need to take to, to make sure that there's some kind of protection.